Hello, everyone, and thank you for staying with us throughout the workshop. We have reached the last session of the workshop, which talks about the registration and listing compliance uh, program. And in this presentation, I will be talking about compliance case process and manual overrides. After completing this presentation, you should be able to describe FDA's registration and listing compliance program. Identify circumstances under which an NDC product code must be changed. And describe the manual override request process. The registration and listing requirements are included in Section 510 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and extensively discussed in 21 Code of Federal Regulations, Part 207. The compliance program started in 2015 with a mission of achieving accuracy and integrity of establishment registration and listing data. And it includes many phases such as surveillance, deficiency letter, data removal, and a final action that can be an untitled letter, warning letter, or data inactivation. The life cycle of a compliance case can completely depend on the severity of the deficiency and if the company takes any action to fix the data uh, within the requested time. In scenario one, when we find a deficiency, we create a compliance case and send a deficiency letter to the contact information included in the labeler code SPL or the establishment registration. We give firms 30 days to fix the data. If the correction is made, the SPL is reviewed by the staff and the case is closed. Once the case is closed, no further action is needed. If the uh, deficiency is not addressed within 30 days, the data is removed from the public sites. These public sites include NDC directory for drug listing and deckers for establishment registration, which have been already discussed in this workshop. After the data removal, a removal notification is sent to the same contact information within the establishment registration SPL or labeler code SPL. And after that removal notification is sent, in some cases, companies realize that they haven't sent any corrections. So then they take action to um, address the deficiency. Once the correction is received, SPL is reviewed by our team and the case is closed. Once the case is closed, the data is released back for publication into NDC directory or Deckers. In the third scenario, uh, firms, even after 30 days and even after the data removal notification is sent, do not take any actions to address the deficiency. Um, that's what we call a lethal error because um, even though it doesn't cause your business to go under, it will cause um, your business some pain, uh, which can include steps such as a warning letter, an untitled letter, or data inactivation. So the final action that FDA take in a registration or listing compliance case depends on the severity of the case. For example, if it's a public health concern when um, there is incorrect labeling included for the product, um, FDA either removes that data immediately or in some cases inactivates the data. If a company shows good faith in at least trying to address the deficiencies, FDA in some cases puts a stop on the way the compliance action uh, progresses into an untitled letter or a warning letter. And also agencies' priorities at the time, uh, for example, the public health emergency that we're in right now puts some of the products or companies at the forefront. At a very high level, the override uh, process uh, to manually load the data due to compliance cases looks something like this. 
the deficiency letter is received and the company starts making revisions to correct the bad data. As um, a result, they receive an error message. Um, if the error message um, is generated because you made a correction um, based on FDA's request, you contact our staff for approval and then forward the approval along with an attachment of the deficiency letter that we initially sent you to the SBL coordinator and request a manual override. So what are manual overrides? It's a process that is sometimes necessary to bypass the validations um, in order to allow certain corrections made to registration and listing data. It is good to uh, keep in mind that an override bypasses all business validations. It's performed by the SPL office. In the case of uh, CEDAR regulated products, a CEDAR approval is required before you send a manual override request to the SPL office. The entire SPL file is reviewed and it's also compared to a previous version to make sure we are not introducing more errors um, into the system. There are certain steps that you have to follow in order to have a successful request, which does not delay your manual overwrite process. Um, I have included these steps here in length and we're not going uh, to go through each and every step, but be sure to follow these in order to avoid delays. Some of the other reasons for delay in your manual overwrite request can be providing inaccurate or incomplete data at the time of request. Or the errors that you have included in your email does not match the actual errors in the error message. If the Core ID or submission ID are not complete. If they're partial, that cause delay in your submission because the SBL team has to try to find your submission. If you reference, reference a previous message, but you fail to include it as an attachment to your manual override request, then that can delay the process. If you send duplicate requests of the same submission ID and manual override request that can delay the process. Or if your subject line is misleading and does not properly and clearly states that request, you're requesting a manual override. So data errors that are included in a submission, so in a way you prepare your SPL and um, you make a mistake by including an incorrect information in the, um, um, within the SPL. That can be either registration or listing SPL. That can cause um, generating or not generating an automated error message. And if it doesn't pass the validation rules, so in a sense, if you get an automated um, error, then you have to resolve the error before your submission is accepted. You can't go any further with that SPL and it's not going to be um, submitted to FDA. Um, in order to check those validation rules, you can um, have the latest version of the SPL implementation guide and validation procedures and uh, make sure you follow all the directions. In some cases, no um, error is generated automatically and the SPL actually passes the validation rules, um, but the error is still there because you um, included an error in, in that case. Um, so those are the ones that are candidates for a compliance case. And an example is um, um, an incorrect carton label. If your carton label refers to a different drug, it's not something that can be caught in an automated um, validation um, process, and so the data is introduced and accepted, um, but it's still wrong. So submission errors that generate automated error messages um, can be put into two groups. Basically, they're either technical or they're compliance errors. Um, an example for a technical error is 
um, when you submit a revision and um, the next version up um, has a lower version number. Um, that can be an example of a technical error. Uh, on the compliance error side, that is uh, when um, an error is introduced in violation of the registration listing requirements under the regulations. Um, for example, here, um, when you list a drug under the ANDA marketing category and include an ANDA number as the uh, marketing authorization reference, which is um, not um, correct or not even approved. Um, also, the submission errors can be generated either in an initial submission or it can be generated in subsequent revisions that you send to FDA. And there are many reasons that you send a second um, version or higher versions of an SPL to FDA. You're either correcting a deficiency that was identified by FDA and sent to you, to you through a deficiency letter, and in those cases, you're making a change to one of those key data elements within the SPL. Uh, by key data element, um, we mean the any data element that um, causes um, an, um, an error message being generated due to the validation rules. Um, for example, if we send you a deficiency letter um, uh, in reference to a dosage form, incorrect dosage form, when you make the correction, you will receive an error um, that is generated automatically, um, and then you have to um, continue with the manual overwrite um, process. Or you can be actually sending a subsequent revision because you're reviewing the data um, in those renewal or update periods for registration and listing, and you're making either a change to one of those key data elements again, or um, it's because when you send a new version of your existing SPL registration or listing, your data goes through um, a whole um, set of validation once again. And if the validation rules have been updated um, and some new validation rules are added and implemented since your last submission, then it might fail uh, those new validation rules, which have to be corrected. Uh, my colleagues already spoke about the common errors in registration and listing. Um, I provided some examples here to apply some of the learnings in this presentation so far. Uh, set ID issues is when um, a firm sends updates or subsequent revisions of an existing SPL. So if a company is uh, sending an update to a registration SPL, a listing SPL, or even a label or code SPL, they have to make sure that they are using um, the same set ID as the um, initial submission. Um, the DUNS issues uh, can be mostly uh, in reference to registration SPLs, but it can also be other SPLs, and that is when uh, the uh, information included in the registration SPL, um, um, like the company's address, does not match the Dunn and Bradstreet's database. Um, for drug listing issues, um, one example is in some dosage forms, such as liquids and patches, the, stre the strength of the active ingredient is expressed in um, a percentage format, um, which is not acceptable for SPL submissions. And so therefore, the percentage has to be converted accurately and correctly uh, to the uh, format that is accepted by um, the SPL. Um, and, and in addition to that, the units of measure included uh, for the strength uh, must be correct. Um, so this is something that might not be caught in the initial uh, validation procedure, um, uh, and it might actually pass the validations, but if the conversion is not done correctly or the units of measure uh, are not included correctly, then um, this can um, cause a, a compliance case to be created and a deficiency letter to be sent to the company. The proprietary name issues can be either 
um, in an in initial submission or in subsequent revisions. Um, if the if proprietary name is missing um, uh, currently, um, then it fails uh, initial validation. So uh, a an error is generated and you must include a proprietary name for your drug listing. Uh, but as we know, a lot of drugs do not have a proprietary name. Um, in those cases, uh, some companies make the error of including a proprietary name anyway to pass the validation rules. Um, but uh, we uh, request that you include either the established name or the non-proprietary name um, of the product in the proprietary name field. Um, so um, the error is either generated because the name is missing, or it can be generated um, in the revisions if you try to change the, the name from what you already included in your initial submission. Um, Labeling is a host of um, different things, um, and that can be um, a missing label, which um, uh, will cause an automatically generated validation error. Um, you have to include a JPEG file that um, includes the carton label. Sometimes that JPEG file is included, but doesn't refer to the listed drug. That is um, another issue. Um, and also the package insert or the prescribing information is not accurate. Um, one example, again, is when the packaging information in the house supplied section does not match the packaging section of the SPL for the listed drug. Um, in those cases, um, although the automated um, uh, validation error is not generated, um, you are putting your company in, in the risk of um, having a compliance case and deficiency letter received. CEDAR's criteria to approve a manual override request um, is only when a change is made due to a deficiency. Uh, so if you are correcting a deficiency because you received an FDA deficiency letter or you found deficiencies through your company's internal review of your data, um, then you can request that manual override um, approval uh, to CEDAR. And um, based on our findings, uh, that, they, that request can be approved. Um, if there are other changes made, especially to a listing SBL, um, if the start marketing date is reached, it most likely will not be approved um, under very narrow circumstances. It can be approved only if the start marketing date is not reached and therefore the data is not published because once the data is released for publication, it not only exists in FDA databases, but also all the downstream users of that data. Outside of that, a new NDC product code is required if a drug's established name or proprietary name changes, if any active ingredient or the strength of active ingredient changes, a drug dosage form changes, um, or the status changes between prescription and non-prescription, or if the intended use between human and animal use um, changes. So under any of these uh, circumstances, a new NDC product code is required to be assigned to the listed drug, and the manual override is not going to be approved by CEDAR. In order to assist companies um, with some resources uh, for our compliance program, we have a web page that is updated periodically, and it includes some um, helpful links um, to provide some assistance in strength conversion in drug listing, um, a document in active moiety versus active ingredient, and it also includes a list of all the registration and listing warning letters that are published to date. Moving to some challenging questions. All revisions made to correct the deficiency will result in a submission validation error. Is that false or true? You can put your answers in the chat box. And as many of you stated, yes, it is false. Um, it doesn't always result in a submission validation error. And question two, 
a pending revision awaiting a manual override will put a stop on all actions below except for NDC directory removal, warning letter, untitled letter, or deficiency letter. Uh, we'll give it 10 seconds. And the answer would be the NDC directory removal because the deficiency letter is already sent at this point. The only thing that will stop uh, would be the case progression into an untitled letter or a warning letter. I know we had quite a lot to cover in this presentation, and I don't expect you to remember it all um, by tomorrow even, um, but I hope you have a couple of uh, big takeaways. And the first one would be to invest in data submission infrastructure of your company. Um, by hiring the right people, you will have the technical expert expertise in-house um, and um, a good understanding of the business requirements and the data itself. Um, if you decide that you want to use a vendor to submit the registration and listing data on your behalf, uh, make sure that they care enough uh, so you send the correct and accurate um, and complete information the first time around. Um, also, you know, have um, um, anyone that does the submission for your company go through trainings um, and get updated on the new requirements. Um, the best one of them all is um, obviously to avoid errors altogether. Um, so um, as you know, the manual overrides can take a long time. Um, it can have an inadvertent effect on um, things such as importation, um, reimbursement. Um, so um, make sure that you, know, you, you put enough time uh, and effort to make a correct submission the first time around. Any questions, please feel free to reach to me directly or uh, to our general mailbox at eDerlis at fda.hhs.gov. Thank you. Hi, uh, we're going to continue the session with a specific project that launched in 2020, and that is the FDA's Drug Listing and Activation Project. Upon completion of this uh, presentation, um, you will be able to provide FDA's listing and activation periods, describe the reasons drug listing files get inactivated by FDA, and also describe um, how those um, inactivated data can be reactivated. As we already discussed, drug listing requirements are included in Section 510 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Specifically under 510B, uh, drug establishments are required to register their establishment with FDA, and they have to uh, renew this registration annually um, between October 1st to December 31st. Um, under Section 510J, these registrants are also required to submit a list of all the drugs they manufacture for U.S. commercial distribution at the time of registration. 510J2D then um, extends this uh, re requirement to send any material changes to a drug previously listed um, every June and December. Before 2016, if a drug listing uh, file was not updated to report any changes, FDA just had to assume that it remained as in the market as is um, and therefore started accumulating a lot of outdated listing data in its database. Um, so with the 2016 revisions made to the regulations, uh, which went into effect November of 2017, um, under 21 CFR 207-57B2, registrants, registrants were required to now 
send a no change certification during the annual registration period for any drugs that were not um, updated or listed in the previous calendar year. In other words, you had to tell FDA that if you didn't send any updates to a drug listing data, um, that uh, you're certifying that there has been no changes made to that list um, in order for it to um, stay active. As a result, um, the listing data and activation project took shape um, and it was first uh, published in a federal register notice on August 14, 2019. The link to the Federal Register Notice is available in this slide for your reference. There are two annual inactivation periods, one January and one in July, and we're going to discuss in the coming slides um, why those two months are um, important months for inactivation. When you send a new drug listing SPL to FDA, it remains certified until um, the um, end of the next calendar year. Um, so if we are already in the next calendar year, um, your uh, drug listing SPL was not a new submission. It did not get updated through, through those update periods in um, June and December at the minimum. Or if um, you did not certify it to be current during the certification period, of October 1 to December 31, then those listing SPLs are considered outdated by FDA and they are candidate for um, inactivation in January. Um, so we started inactivating 30 days after publication of the FRN um, in 2019, but um, the January inactivation project first started in 2020 um, and it will continue happening every year in January. Um, and um, an email notification prior to um, inactivation is sent to the labeler contact um, on file who um, will be notified about the FDA's intent to inactivate the record. If a drug is inactivated in January, but it's still in the market, it might have been because they missed the certification period. So once you get that notification, or if your drug is inactivated, you can reactivate the data by submitting a new version of the drug listing SBL. And you have to keep in mind that's the only way you can reactivate the data because the no change certification SBL not, uh, is not accepted after December 31st. That document type is not available for you to use. Of course, if there are any updates made, instead of sending just a new version without any updates, go through the file and review and make any necessary updates that you need to make to the previously listed drug. We have seen cases that um, companies treat the inactivation as um, a means to um, report to FDA that their drug is discontinued. Um, and that is not the case. Even if your record is inactivated, um, that doesn't relieve you from your legal obligation under the regulations to send um, um, an update to your drug listing in June or December at the minimum to report to FDA that you have ceased manufacturing um, a listed drug. Um, so even in those cases, you have to access the listing SPL um, and change the marketing status to complete um, and add an end marketing date that is the last lot expiration date of the listed drug. Um, inactivation due to lack of certification does not eliminate um, your drug listing update responsibilities. Uh, one example that comes to mind is um, the reason that we want to keep an end marketing date um, in your discontinued drug listing is that even if you discontinue manufacturing a drug, your um, listed drug can remain in the market um, until its last sort of expiration date, which in some cases can be um, a couple of years um, or more from um, the, the date that you stopped manufacturing or distributing that drug. Um, and we want that information to uh, stay available on the databases um, 
if the drug is still in commercial distribution, even though you stopped manufacturing or distributing. Uh, if we inactivate the, the data, um, all the information will be removed while the product itself remains in the market. So it's very important for you to continue uh, meeting the requirements um, in updating your drug listing data with FDA. So June is another month where uh, companies are required to send any updates um, to their drug listing files. Um, um, and one of the things that they need to review and send their updates in is the a list of establishments that are included in the drug listing as the manufacturing establishment for that listed drug. Um, if in uh, July your drug listing has not been updated, um, but it still um, includes at least one establishment that is not duly registered with FDA, that record is considered outdated by us. So um, in July, we uh, first, uh, similar to the January inactivation, send an email notification um, about the intent. Um, and uh, we did that first in July 2020, and we will continue um, every year in um, July for these outdated uh, records um, to be inactivated. Um, time and time again during this presentation, you heard about uh, different reasons we try to reach out to the labeler contact or to the uh, registration contact um, in the uh, records that you have sent to FDA. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize how important it is for us to have uh, the correct and most updated information for your contact. Um, because if you um, have an outdated uh, data in there, um, you will not receive these notifications, but that doesn't stop us from moving forward with the actions that we intend to take, in this case, the inactivation. Um, so please pay utmost attention to um, updating your contact information uh, through both um, labeler code and registration SBL contacts um, as you are required under the regulations. So there are different uh, scenarios under which the um, July inactivation um, takes place. So the first one is that if your drug is still in the market, but is manufactured at a different facility, but you miss the June listing update requirement to include that new facility, after you receive that notification, you just have to submit an updated drug listing file um, that uh, includes the new manufacturing facility that is currently registered. And that will remove your uh, drug from the inactivation list. Or if it's already inactivated, it will reactivate the data. The next scenario is when um, the drug is still in the market, uh, but the manufacturing establishment included um, on the drug listing SBL failed to renew its registration at the end of um, the October 1st to December 31st renewal period. In those cases, um, you will have to submit an updated registration SBL uh, for the existing establishments. Um, or if you use a contract manufacturer, you contact the establishment and notify them um, the need to renewal um, uh, their registration with FDA. The third case is, as I mentioned, the drug is no longer manufactured. Um, so if um, in, in some scenarios it goes out of business or it doesn't manufacture drugs anymore. Um, so that drug is um, going to be discontinued, but you still have to send um, an updated listing SPL to discontinue drug with the appropriate marketing status and marketing end dates. You learned in the previous presentation that the um, listing and activation project um, is not the only time that FDA inactivates data. Um, if a data is um, connected to a compliance case, um, then it's, um, it can be inactivated because of that compliance case. Um, in, in this scenario, it can be either a registration or listing data 
or even um, a labeler code SBL. Um, this can happen any time during the year, so it's not just bound to the January and July inactivation periods. Um, and the data is only reactivated after you send your corrections. We review um, the data for accuracy uh, to make sure that all the deficiencies are addressed and we close the case before the data can be reactivated. As a result of the drug listing and activation project, FDA um, has inactivated data uh, for 53,196 outdated products in its system. Uh, we expected that this year we have uh, probably the largest amount of inactivations because um, the outdated data had piled up for years and years. Um, so we're hoping that moving forward uh, with bringing uh, more firms into compliance, um, we, um, we have um, a smaller number to inactivate each year. One immediate consequence of uh, drug listing data inactivation is uh, uh, its removal from publication. That includes the NDC directory for FDA databases. Um, the, data is inact uh, the data that is inactivated is also transmitted to DailyMed, and we know at least for the January um, inactivation, they have removed the outdated um, data from DailyMed. Um, also, the NSDE file has been updated to include two new columns, which are the FDA inactivation and reactivation dates, um, and those inactivation dates can inadvertently affect the uh, reimbursement of the drug by CMS. So will the data be uh, republished? And um, the answer is yes, um, once it's reactivated. Uh, but you um, also have to remember that for the reactivation um, uh, to take place, it might take 24 to 48 hours after a successful submission. Um, also, after the submission is received by FDA, it can take another 24 business hours for the reactivate data to be republished in those uh, websites. Um, so we have a couple of challenge questions again. The first one asks, if a listing data is inactivated due to a compliance case, an FDA compliance officer must review the, up, uh, review the updates in order for the data to be reactivated. Is that true or false? And the answer, um, of course, is true, as we discussed. Question number two, FDA's drug listing and activation project periods are June and December, October to December, January and July, or it can happen any time of the year. Um, let's wait 10 seconds for everyone to put their answers in the chat box. Correct. It is January and July. Um, those other um, choices are um, the listing updates, the registration renewal, certification period, um, and um, the, the, the option D applies only to the ones that are compliance cases, um, the ones that are inactivated due to the drug listing and activation project. Um, happens in January and July each year. Um, I hope, um, again, your biggest takeaway from this presentation is to review and update your drug listing files um, at the minimum in June and December of each calendar year as required. Um, but uh, we request that you um, send those updates to us as soon as um, you can and as soon as the change takes, eff takes effect. Um, also, um, please keep your contact information current. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, my email address is provided here. Uh, but if you find that email address too long, then you can uh, send your question to the friendly eDurlis mailbox at eDurlis at fda.hhs.gov. 
Um, thank you. And I'm going to turn it um, to Julian. Hi, guys. So um, I'm here live with you guys to do the case study of a violation. This is um, an interactive kind of a session so that you guys can get your hands a little bit down and dirty and see uh, what you can apply from everything you've learned today. So um, just wanted to let you guys know that um, if you haven't already done, down at the bottom there's a link where you can download the package. So uh, well, I plan to introduce the cases to you guys and um, the answers will be in the case package. You have to use it in order to be able to solve the, um, the cases. So. All right, let's get started. All right, so some things I want you guys to get from this case study is I want you guys to be able to troubleshoot your establishment registration and drug listing issues. Um, I also uh, hope that you guys will be able to then be able to identify and fix the validation errors that are happening when you submit these SPL files. So this will be uh, I'm going to give you guys two good examples and then hopefully you can apply that to your cases. All right, so how this is going to work um, in our little online virtual program is after I introduce the case, I'll give you a little bit of time to review the case and the study packet for the answers. Uh, at the very beginning, the chat is, avail is available, but please do not post the answers yet. Uh, use that chat for any uh, questions or clarifications. Uh, Layla and I will be monitoring that and then answer them live as to help you guys move the, um, through the cases. And then after I give you guys enough time to, to try to figure it out on your own, we will be discussing the answers later on in the presentation. So okay, your first case here is um, a hand sanitizer case. So what happens? You receive the deficiency letter from us. Um, some things to consider. What is, uh, what is stated in the deficiency letter? And what steps do you need to take to resolve the deficiency? So go ahead and click on the uh, link that is provided for you in the presentation for the case study packets. Read through the, uh, the um, deficiency letter and then the associated uh, SPL documents uh, below that. And Jeff, if you can transfer onto the case study packets for those who um, haven't been able to see it. All right, so um, here we go. This is the uh, case study packet right here. And this is the deficiency letter, the first thing you, you're getting. And I'm scrolling slowly because I know this does have a tendency to jump sometimes. And then right after this deficiency letter ends here, this is a the content of labeling for the SPL file. And it will be hard to read uh, on the screen, but if you download the packet, you can zoom in and, and read through that. And then here's the JPEG, the uh, representative label that's associated with it. And then this is the SPL files that are associated with it. So go ahead and take the time, uh, look through it, see what did the deficiency letter say, um, and looking through the SPL documents, uh, what do you think needs to change? And again, if you have any questions about the process, go ahead and put it in. Um, just hold off just a tiny bit regarding the um, the questions, but um, looks like I think everybody understands the process, so we can uh, we can move on to um, to the next part here. Okay, so 
what do you guys think? Now, um, type, go ahead and use the chat box to type in what, uh, where you think the problems are, what was the problem, and um, what steps do you need to do to, to resolve that problem. Okay, so reading through it. Um, update the SPL to correct the active ingredients and their strength. The label strength, 75%, inputted 80%, need to update to 75%. Okay, very good. Percent of alcohol, 75 to 80. Aha, see, so everybody's catching the, um, the percentage different, the strength error, but um, someone also caught that uh, isopropyl alcohol is not ethanol. So within the active ingredient, it says that it's an isopropyl wipe, but they listed it using alcohol, which is ethanol. So that needs to be corrected as well. All right, let's see what else, you guys. Incorrect active. You guys are experts. You've been paying attention all day. <laughs> That's good. Okay, yeah, so, um, yeah, you guys are, are getting it right there. So, um, just to summarize here, so at the deficiency letter, the case packet, it said exactly uh, what we wanted you to summarize. So Jeff, if we could go back to the case study packet, I just want to point it out for those who didn't catch it the first time. So he, oh, there he goes jumping. All right, so this is the, the uh, initial deficiency letter. And don't get intimidated by all these legalese here. Um, it's there because it has to be there. Um, and we try to summarize what you need to know at the very bottom, wrong active ingredient and wrong strength. But it, you need to review your entire listing to look at where these issues are occurring. So the wrong active ingredient, is it a problem in the labeling or is it in the problem in the SPL? The strength that you're saying, is it in the, the label? Is it within the content of labeling? Is it in the SPL? So it can be in a lot of different places. So this just, but this does point you in the right direction of uh, where to go, okay? And then as you eagle-eyed participants notice that here it says the content of labeling is alcohol 80%. Uh, meanwhile, the label says isopropyl alcohol 75%. So we were actually seeing a lot of that because there has been, um, that they were using a template and then not updating the template as they updated their product. So, um, and then here we go in the SPL, alcohol, um, 80 ml over 100 ml. That is, um, alcohol is ethanol. So that, and that is chemically different from isopropyl alcohol. So those are two different active ingredients, even though, um, a lay person may think it's the same. It's, it's different, so that needs to change. And I just kind of wanted to point this out here, and you guys could kind of study this a little bit later. If you guys are um, a lot, we've been getting a lot of questions regarding wipes and how to list it. So alcohol, you're since you're doing the the strength as 80 mL over 100 mL, or in this case, it should have been 75 mL over 100 mL then you need to input the total amount of mLs that are in a canister. Or if it's in an individual wrap packet, how many mLs are in each packet? And then after that, you say how much uh, wipes are in there. So the first part, the innermost, is how much mL, so it corresponds with the strength. Otherwise, you'll get a validation error. And then the second part is the actual quantity of wipes. So let's Go back to the presentation. And OK, so um, just finish up the answers, the summary. So first, you just review the listings and look for the specific issues. Make sure to look for it in all the different parts. You correct the specific issues. Um, and then save and validate. And that feature is there for you to check everything before you actually submit. and um, once you do, and once you have resolved everything, you hit submit the SPL. 
But there, as Layla explained, there are changes in here that's not allowed, including active ingredient strength and, um, and the active ingredient itself. So it will require a manual override, so please follow the manual override as needed. Okay, so uh, very good job, guys. And here's another example uh, of another case study, and this is related to inactivation. Okay, so um, same scenario. You receive a deficiency letter from the FDA. Um, the things to consider, what did the deficiency letter tell you, and then what steps do you have to take to resolve this de deficiency. And um, let's go to the case study packet now. By now, you guys have probably already downloaded it. <clears throat> OK. So here we go, case number two, inactivated drugs. And you are, it's addressed to you, you're a boss in Wonder Pharma. And this is what the deficiency letter says. And then at the, the box, we point out what um, SPL set ID we identified as at risk for inactivation. So after reading that, you look at your drug listing SPL that the, that included that set ID. So those set IDs match. And then you also look at your establishment registrations. OK, so if you guys have questions about um, specific things in the packet or the process, do that now. I'll give you just a couple minutes um, to read through everything and look through things before I give you a chance to uh, comment on the answers. So, let's see. I'm seeing, let's see, a couple questions here um, about a registered company outside of the U.S. Um, set IDs and root IDs are the same. Establishment registration is outdated. Yeah, so everybody already has has um has their little theories. That's good. I like it. I, I'm not gonna say what's right or wrong right now. Just giving everybody a chance to uh, look through it first. Okay, let's um, move on to the um, official answers here. So if you do, um, you guys are a little bit ahead of me and already kind of pointing at the answers and what you think, but if you haven't, um, if you're a rule follower and you haven't had the chance yet waiting for me to pull up the slide before you post your answers, go ahead and post the answers and I um, am curious to see. And I'm actually seeing some, some things that I didn't expect, so. And then I'll address those. I want to. I'll go through the official answers first, and I'll address some of the things that I'm seeing in here, um, and just kind of explain it so you guys um, will will kind of understand it. So um, let's see here. Um, in the listing, it contained a non-registered establishment. Um, so let's go into the case study packet, so I can point that out. Um, and you guys can see it. Um, so let's go back up. And okay, in your drug li listing SPL, it said that uh, two establishments were involved in this manufacturing, Wonder Pharma China and Wonder Pharma. So then you look at the establishment registrations you have, and you see that they're both accepted. Great, that's fine. But um, 
the if you look at the last date modified, the Wonder Pharma was accepted October 1, 2019. So that means that's good until the end of the year, this year, uh, December 31st, 2020. But then you see that uh, Wonder Pharma, um, they last modified their, um, they last modified their uh, establishment registration October 1st, 2018. So that means they didn't renew it last year, and therefore it's expired. It, this one expired uh, December 31st, 2019. So come in, come 2020, it's expired and it's getting inactivated. So you guys, some super eagle-eyed um, uh, participants here. Was no, we're looking kind of at the the set ID and root ID, and I. Um, wasn't expecting that because these are actually, I mean, obviously Wonder Pharma is not a real company, so these are fake submissions. And um, so some of the, the root IDs and set IDs won't match. But mainly you just kind of have to look at the registration dates and when, if it is submitted or not submitted. So in this case, uh, you had access to both Wonder Pharma and um, Wonder Pharma China's. Uh, establishment registration, but sometimes you won't have that. So sometimes you just have your own uh, establishment registration and then your contract manufacturers or your sister subsidiary establishments are um, do their own registration. So if you look at the drug listing SPL, you have to see who, who are all the establishments that are involved. And then you have to check it either on your own or ask them to verify that they are duly registered. So in this case, you can verify that it wasn't, and so then that was um, the reason why this is at risk for getting for getting um, inactivated. And these are just the two uh, the, the 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 two uh, registrations that are part of it. So um, yeah, so if you weren't the um, if you didn't have access to it, you know, as a boss, then you have to contact the registration. Uh, person and this one's the Mulan princess here is the one so you would have to call her or email her and get her to fix it. So let's go back to the um, presentation and just to uh, kind of uh, reiterate what we just talked about. So yeah, review the establishment sections in that listing and then you verify that all the listings um, are part of the manufacturing process and sometimes you you have um, companies that are still in the establishment that you used or you replaced. So at that point you have to establish, uh, you have to uh, update the drug listing to change the establishment and then that fix it, fixes it too. So then you verify that all the cited establishments are duly registered. And then after that, you submit the updated registrations for any um, non-renewed registrations or contact uh, contact the establishment to notify them of the need to register. And in the case where the drug listing had wrong establishments or outdated establishments, you change the establishment in the drug listing. Then you resubmit the drug listing, and that's what fixes it. And actually, in the... Um, in the uh, deficiency letter, it outlines it all kind of there for you. So, all right. So, um, just as a summary, you know, like registration and listing information is used throughout FDA. So, it supports our programs such as drug shortages, uh, who to inspect and when, and the supply chains. So, um, consumers also use, and healthcare providers use our data. So it's published in Daily Med, and then it's pulled for all these like compendia. So having the accurate information is really, really important, uh, not just for us, but throughout the whole industry. So that's why it's very important. And if we send you uh, a, a violation, a deficiency, that you uh, fix it and fix it timely. So um, that is this portion for the. The, the live case study. I was really impressed with all your um, eagle-eyed um, answers and everything like that. And we will move on to the final portion, which is the top do's and don'ts. And then we'll, after that, we'll take questions.
Thanks for that introduction. Thank Again, for that my name is Julian Chun. Again, I'm a pharmacist with the drug registration and listing drug staff. Today, I want to talk to you guys about the top do's and don'ts for registration and listing. So some things I want you guys to take home. I want you guys to be able to develop best practices for uh, registration and listings. Um, and also get a better understanding of the pitfalls that lead to deficient submissions. So let's dive right in there here. Registration dues. As a reminder, domestic establishments, those are establishments in the United States, they have to register no later than five calendar days after beginning to manufacture. And foreign establishments, they need to um, register before a drug is offered for import or imported into the United States. And that's very important because your drug products will get stuck at the border if you don't um, register properly. <clears throat> and um, as a reminder, you guys already know, uh, registration is um, needs to be renewed annually between October 1st and December 31st, uh, which is our annual renewal period. Uh, happening right now. So if you don't do that, your registration will expire and for the next calendar year, you will be considered non-registered. Some more registration dues. There are expedited registration updates that may, must be sent within 30 days. So you, you can't wait until the annual renewal period. So if you're closing or selling an establishment, you need to let us know that within 30 days you any changes regarding um, the name or physical address of the establishment that um, needs to be sent in within 30 days and if there's any changes to the contact information or to the u.s agent that needs to be updated expeditiously so i have down here highlighted in red um, regarding sending us an email about terminating or designating a new employee or US agent um, but via email. So that does not count. Um, you know, sometimes we'll get a US agent that says, you know, uh, we're not representing this establishment anymore because they didn't pay their bill or other issue. And, and that's fine. Unfortunately, the US agent is still the official contact until they get changed out of the establishment registration. So, if you're a US agent and you have a non-cooperating establishment, we can open up a compliance case on your behalf and force them to change the US agent information before they can renew and stay duly registered. So we can do that. But um, yeah, just emphasize the fact that an email notification is not sufficient for any of those types of changes. Regarding registration don'ts, do not register if you do not perform any manufacturing activities. So an example of that are PLDs, private label distributors. So like CVS ibuprofen or Target's Up and Up ibuprofen, that's, um, that's their branded drug, but they don't manufacture it. They contract out all the manufacturing, they just market it under their name. So they, they are private label distributors. Um, and they do not register because they do not perform any manufacturing activities. Another example of that, of you know, some, someone that should not register are drug sponsors. So um, a drug sponsor may, you know, sponsor the application, they own the application, and once they get it approved, they contract out all the um, manufacturing processes. So even though they own the application, they should not register because they're not performing any manufacturing activities. They have other filings that they do with FDA for um, <clears throat> regarding the application, but regarding establishment registration, they should not do it. Um, another thing I wanted to, to emphasize that should not be done is including the vendor's contact information in the establishment registration. So if you are using a contractor to submit your registration or listing, or if you are the contractor submitting registration and listing on behalf of other organizations, you should not, you should not input your information 
in place of an establishment contact. So the establishment or registrant's contact information must be employees of that establishment and they are the um, regulatory manager or whoever is in charge of managing that process within that organization. Um, another don't that we want to emphasize here is that you should not register an establishment unless you are an authorized agent. So it seems kind of cut and dry, but we've had some examples of um, companies registering another company without their knowledge. So say you, you know, want to import <clears throat> um, hand sanitizer from China and then that manufacturer says, okay, well, we don't know anything about registration and listing in the United States. Will you register for us? That's fine. You're acting as an authorized agent and they know about it. But um, yeah, if they do not give you explicit permission to register, don't do it. Okay, so now let's transition to labeler codes and some dues for that. As a reminder, uh, each person who engages in manufacturing, repacking, relabeling, or private label distribution must apply for our NDC labeler code. So, um, whereas PLDs had no registration, registration obligations, they do have listing obligations. And in order to list drugs, they need to have a labeler code. So um, once you have a labeler code, one thing that I want to emphasize is that the NDC format must remain the same. So an example is um, if you choose a 541 configuration, five digit labeler code, four digit product code, one digit package code, you have to stay with that. So companies that you know, have a lot of different products, we'll choose 541 because they have over 10,000 different products that they can choose. Repackagers may choose 532 because um, the two digit product code enables, gives them a hundred different package configurations. But once you list using one configuration, you have to stay with that the whole time. So keep that in mind. Uh, another labeler code do, just like the establishment uh, registration, there are, you have to, you have to make updates to your labeler code request SPL file if there's any changes to the labeler contact information um, or any changes to activities and business operations. So generally, you guys are really good about updating your establishment registration, um, I guess because there's an annual uh, requirement to renew. It's uh, pretty accurate every time we have a uh, question about establishment registrations, we can get in touch with you. However, I can't say the same for labeler codes. Um, when there is a problem with a listing, we send the deficiency letter or emails to the labeler code contact. And um, we are finding that a lot of it is outdated. Um, so I'd like you guys to think about adding this process of updating the labeler code request SPL file um, as a best practice so that this information is constant because just because the person is no longer there and you guys didn't receive the deficiency letter doesn't absolve you from the requirement that you need to fix it and then that compliance case um, just escalates further and further the um, more you don't know about it so keep that in mind please uh, more labeler code dues. Um, wanted to let you know that labeler codes are transferable. So um, if you merge or acquire uh, a company that has a labeler code, you can transfer it with the caveat that all the drug products uh, must be transferred. So say I'm getting acquired, I have five drug products. The company acquiring me only really wants three of them. So the two that they don't want, um, I can sell it, but if I sell it or delist it, then I must, or discontinue it, then I must delist it. So, um, if I sell it, then I input a marketing status of complete, an end marketing date, uh, corresponding to the expiration date of the last lap, lot manufactured and that delist that drug product. And then whoever bought my drug product can list it under their own labeler code. 
and NDC, but then the three products that are left over, that can be um, transferred over to the new um, acquiring firm. So um, another thing that needs to happen when you guys are merging is that the labeler code requests SPL file must be updated to include the latest information. So if there's any changes to the contact information, uh, if you're going to change the name of the labeler, uh, address, business operation, all of that must be updated. And then um, finally, the drug listings are not linked up to the labeler code SPL. So if you uh, acquire a drug product and change the name, you need to go into every drug product that is listed under that labeler code to change out the labeler information within that drug information, uh, the drug listing file so that it is updated and accurate um, and that needs to happen. So what should not happen in um, regarding to labeler codes is that you should not request additional labeler codes if you already have one. So in cases, very, very rare cases where all your available product codes are assigned and you have no more left, you can request another labeler code. But as you guys may or may not know, we are at the tail end of available labeler codes. We are working on a new NDC format. Um, stay tuned, more news to come on that. And we do not want to run out of labeler codes before a new format is established. So please, 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 if you um, don't need additional labeler codes because you haven't run out, don't request one. And hearkening back to the last slide, if you've acquired or merged with a company, you may have ac already have access to another labeler code. Uh, please use that before requesting for another one. Um, and as in the establishment registration, the um, vendor's contact information has no place in the labeler code request contact information. So um, this goes for establishments and to uh, the vendors. Do not put your contact information in place of the uh, labeler codes. Someone that part of that firm needs to be in that labeler code request SPL file. So um, let's transition now to listing dues. Listings um, must be done with no later than three calendar days after the initial registration of the establishment. Um, regarding PLDs, they may list their own labeled drug products. However, the um, requirement is for contract manufacturers to list. They must list under their own labeler code and then they must also list under the PLDs labeler code. But some PLDs prefer to list their own products and they may do so as an authorized agent of the contract manufacturer. And um, as a requirement, listings must be um, updated every June or December if there's any changes. So we ask that you check your listings at least every June or December, but the best practices that I have found within firms is that they have a process that updates listings as the changes occur. So if you're, you know, a small company, you only have five or six products, every June or December, it's not that hard to just mark your calendar, reread through all your listings and check it and then move on. But if you're a company with thousands of products, that's a little bit burdensome and on onerous. So um, if you make changes and update it right away, then you will ensure that every June or December it will be right. So um, that's something that is, is required and we are uh, finding that, yeah, December, a lot of people now are making the changes because of the listing certification requirements, but every June we are activate, inactivating um, several listings because they are incorrect or have uh, missing information. Some more listing dues for you. If there's no update, then during the renewal period, 
you can submit a no changes listing certification uh, that can only be done during the renewal period. Um, also, another thing to note about that is if you are submitting a listing certification for a drug product with an open compliance case, it will be accepted, but it's not fixing your uh, listing. Um, it won't extend the certification date until you fix the actual error and submit an update. So just to note that. Um, also regarding listings, anyone can do it. A subsidiary or a parent company, some companies have one person in the uh, corporate office doing all the listings and managing all that. Some of them do it per establishment, so each establishment uh, manages their own listings. So however it works um, for you guys, just keep doing that, but it is allowed um, to have different uh, people managing that. Also regarding listings, um, you need to include every establishment involved in the supply chain. So if one location is doing the API manufacturer, then it goes to another location for um, the pressing of the tablets, then it goes to another location that's packaging the drug products, and then another location um, labeling the drug products. All four of those establishments must be included in that drug listing file. Um, we need a complete and accurate supply chain so, and that's, that's one way to get it, and that is, um, that's required. And uh, the last slide for listing dues I have here is I um, want to emphasize that if you're repackaging drugs, your labeling must follow the sources, drug labeling. And if there's any updates, you must include the updates in your, um, in your labeling as well. So um, there needs to be some sort of like policy and procedure in place so that uh, you guys are sourcing out these, um, these changes so that you can um, make the changes as soon as you, you, you see them and um, update your listings uh, right away. So also wanted to emphasize that inactive ingredients uh, are required. You need to include all the inactive ingredients. You don't need to input the amount or the strengths of it, So, but you do need to include each active ingredient um, in the listings. And the last thing is that um, you, you're, you need marketing authority to um, bring drugs into commercial distribution. So whether that's an approved application or you're following an OTC monograph, uh, you need to include your marketing authority within the listing. So just make sure that the application number you're citing within the listing is approved, it's active, and it actually refers to the listed drug that's in there. We are finding some discrepancies with the um, application number cited and the listed drugs. Okay, as far as the don'ts are concerned, do not list drugs, non-drugs with cedar. Do not list non-drugs with cedar. So if you're a dietary supplement and you list with cedar, then we consider you drug. You're gonna, your establishments are going to get inspected as drug manufacturers. Your labeling is gonna need to conform to uh, drug product labeling rules. So uh, do not list non-drugs with cedar. Uh, regarding um, certification lapses, you are required to delist your drugs when you're no longer making it. So if you're discontinuing a drug product, uh, please go in there, change your marketing status to complete, input the end marketing date corresponding to the expiration date of the last lot manufactured. And this tells us that this drug is gonna stay on the market until this date when it all expires out and then it's not there anymore. When you don't certify a drug product, um, it will get inactivated, it will expire, but uh, just as a reminder, um, inactivation is a compliance action. So um, when you have these um, 
ex expirations in there, it just creates more work for us in the back end to, to try to figure out if that drug is still in the market or not. Uh, so please, please, please make sure to discontinue the drug product when you're no longer making it. And as far as another listing, don't please, please, please do not uh, submit a drug product without uh, a listing without double checking it or proofreading it first. So, um, I mean, this goes for establishment registration and labeler code requests as well, but those are relatively short and it's easy. And listings are long and cumbersome, but uh, two things with it. Um, we do share our listing information with uh, the public. So it's published in Daily Med, uh, labels at FDA. So this is a reflection of your drug product. And if you have spelling errors, mistakes, it just looks unprofessional. Secondly, if you have a problem with um, like a, so strengths or um, active ingredients, you can't just, and you find out about it, you can't just go back and change it and that's that. Like you have to, um, you know, it it's, uh, may require a manual override and the process is cumbersome, it is lengthy and, you know, it can take several weeks to months sometimes. So, um, you know, you, it's not easily fixed and that compliance case will stay open that whole time. So if you don't get anything else from my, um, presentation of top do's and don'ts. The top don't is don't submit without double checking or proofreading. So, okay, I'm going to test out what you guys have learned and I'll start with off. I'll start off with an easy one here. So changes in labeler code information include the name, physical address and email address or other contact information must be updated within 60 days, 90 days, 30 days, or every June and December. I'll give you guys um, a minute or two to get that uh, worked out. Okay, so um, the answer is 30 days. And um, again, like um, every June and December is for listing in general, but the labeler code information must be updated within 30 days. So that way, if there's any issues that we have regarding your drug product, we can contact you right away. Okay, so your next challenge question, um, why is double checking a listing before submitting it important? Is it because some errors cannot be fixed by a subsequent submission? They must be fixed through a manual override. Is it because multiple submissions clog the FDA system and slow the entire process for everyone? How about uh, submitting incorrect information will resort, resort in a warning letter? And or is it because FDA charges per submission? So if you keep submitting it over and over, it's going to cost your firm a lot of money. What do you guys think? So yes, the correct answer is A, some errors cannot be fixed by a subsequent submissions. They must be fixed through a manual override. And like I said, that process is not easy for you. It's not easy for us. So please double check before you submit. Uh, the other answers are not right. I'll just kind of go over it real quick is because um, yes, if we are getting a lot of multiple submissions, it will be slower. But, you know, instead of a few minutes getting a uh, answer back, it might just be like, um, it will be longer, but it won't be like the end of the world. Um, 
submitting incorrect information will result in a warning letter. And it can, but not all, all the time. Sometimes we just we want you to fix something. It's just a, um, a notification letter. Um, but they won't always result in a warning letter. If it's bad enough, we will send you a warning letter. And we actually do not charge for submission. So I think if we did, there would be more double checking. So I'm going to talk to management about that. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, so all joking aside, um, the there's more resources here for you guys. There's a link to the act that created registration and listing requirements, the um, CFR where all the rules and regulations are regarding registration and listing, and then um, a link to our compliance web page in case you had more questions about what you need to do in order to make sure that you're complying with the laws. So, um, we are reserving questions until the end of our section. So this slide is just to let you know that if you do have any compliance related questions, uh, you can email it at either list at fda.hhs.gov and it will get triaged to one of us and we'll answer you um, as soon as we can. But if you do have technical questions regarding um, how to submit or having problems, then your best bet is to contact Cedar Direct at fda.hhs.gov and they can triage that for you. So I want to thank you very much and I want to transition this to the next speaker. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Julian. And uh, we will now spend the last few minutes here um, answering the several good, really good questions that, that came in through the last uh, session. We will try to get to as many as we can. Um, I know, again, once again, as Julian just said, uh, you, you saw those um, email addresses um, just a moment ago on the slide. If we don't get to your question, and some of them we are purposefully skipping, they're either not completely relevant or they're very uh, unique or specific maybe to one situation. Uh, feel, please feel free to send these questions to edrls at fda.hhs.gov. Um, so now we're just going to try and push through these as best we can. Um, I'll, I invite again Layla and Julian to join in on this panel. I will actually take the first one because several questions were about timing of manual override, how long they take, and, and um, what's the standard response. And my answer to that is we have no standard time. We have no guarantee that any manual override will, will be done in any particular set of time. They are uh, just that. They are manual. Everyone is different. Everyone has to be fully reviewed uh, to make sure that you're not just correcting what you're supposed to be correcting, but that other things aren't being changed. Um, and it's a coordination between two offices. So. Um, if you think you, you know, I would suggest reviewing your data starting now. Don't wait till December uh, to renew or to check on your drug listing data, um, just in case a manual override is needed. If it is, uh, start submitting your your corrections now and get in line. We and we generally process overrides in the order that they are received, and in some cases there might be some back and forth to require other information and verification. So. Um, uh, please, uh, please do so. Start early um, and and just yeah, uh, dot your eyes, cross your t's, and if the best way to get through a manual override is to avoid it altogether. Um, we've said several times today, uh, uh, double check your work, measure twice and cut once. It's better to prevent the error from get the submission from going in wrong in the first place um, than it is uh, to have to correct it later. Um, okay, we'll uh, start with uh, Layla. Um, we have uh, some questions about the deficiency letters. Um, I'm going to combine the first two here in the one question. Do we have to reply to the compliance email advising that our SPL file has been addressed? And if we, if we do reply, how long does it take FDA generally to answer the deficiency letter response? Um, let me first um, say a shout out to um, everyone participating, especially in the Eastern Hemisphere. 
Uh, they're probably um, awake well into the night uh, to be with us. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, as far as the deficiency letters, there is no need to respond to the deficiency letter if you are making the revisions and you had a successful submission. Um, we, um, at our end, receive a notification when you revise um, and successfully submit um, uh, your, um, your revisions, correcting those deficiencies, and so there's no need to follow up on that. However, if there is um, any kind of um, error messages which needs a manual override, and so therefore you need an approval from CEDAR before re uh, requesting that manual override, um, you do have to uh, reply and request that from us to be reviewed and approved. Um, as far as when we respond to those um, letters, um, as soon as possible. We know you are um, on a time crunch, and we give you 30 days to correct those deficiencies. So as soon as we see the re re revisions, it probably takes a few business days um, at most. And um, if um, the revisions are made, if there is um, all the corrections are made, the case is closed, you might not hear back from us. You just see the data is released back to the public sites. If there is a manual override request, we, we review the data and we um, respond with the approval, or uh, in some cases, it's not an approval, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, I'll answer the next one. It's about receiving email notifications. Um, and again, just a reminder to make sure when you review your registration and listing and uh, your labeler code uh, data, to make sure the contacts are up to date. If you have not received any notifications from us in a little while, uh, that's a good indication you might have an old email address. We, we even just recently sent out an email blast advertising this event today. Um, so if you didn't get that, that's a, that's a good indication that maybe you're not, uh, the, the email, the contact info is not up to date. So. Um, Please uh, go in there. We have not yet sent out our, our just normal, hey, it's time to renew. We're going to get that out uh, hopefully very soon, uh, just our normal announcement of the renewal season. But again, just a reminder to um, uh, please uh, check and renew and, and just make sure your contact info is up to date. Uh, back to Layla. Uh, is there a list of certain corrections that will require a manual override? Do we always? Uh, is there always a case where, or for certain corrections, will it always require a manual override, or is it a case-by-case -case basis? Well, you can always um, request for a manual override, but it doesn't always get approved because, for example, if you are, if you have a product in the market and you just decide to change its proprietary name and you um, get a validation failure, um, a, a, a submission to us, um, and requesting a manual override. I can tell you even now, without looking at the case, it will not be approved because when you change your um, product proprietary name um, and you get an error message, that means that you have to change your NDC product code and, and um, it will not be approved. However, if you're changing the proprietary name because the initial submission was an error. Um, for example, if your labeling refers to a certain proprietary name and your SPL includes a different version of the name um, and you're trying to correct it either by because you reviewed your SPL and you found that error or because you received a deficiency letter from FDA, you will have to uh, make that correction. And then for that specific case, you can come to us and, and say, um, I made this correction, but it's not passing the validation rules, obviously, and will you approve my manual override? In those cases, um, and please be careful about this, because we have seen cases where people change a proprietary name as we requested, but then they also change um, something else, which is now a new error introduced into the system. And so make sure that, that you you make the correction and, and make all the corrections that are required and then request the manual override. If you are introducing another error, um, even though if you are correcting the one we asked you to correct, the manual override is not going to be approved. So there are very many different variations which we cannot necessarily um, include them all in this presentation, but depending on if this is 
an error that is being corrected or if it was um, a revision, you know, um, depending on the case, it can be a manual override request. And then specifically, I think this is one of those specific cases of what you just mentioned, but um, a company talks about having a, a BLA withdrawn because they're going to file a uh, biosimilar. Um, and as a result, the name of the product is going to get the, the one of their standard biologics suffixes. And they're asking if they can reuse the MDC. Can they? Um, it, again, depends on the case because um, if you um, listed the product initially with uh, Cedar um, with a future marketing end date, for example, and then before the product hit the market, um, you realize that you have to use a different pathway and you change, um, um, you know, certain things about the drug listing, and now this is a CBER regulated product, then um, depending on what you're changing and if the marketing start date has not been reached, then you can certainly send it to us to, to be reviewed. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to switch over to Julian now and, and send a few questions his way. Uh, first of all, we did have a question about whether the case study slides will be uh, included. They weren't in the initial download of all the slides, and uh, I have been told that, yes, they will be added eventually to the, to the uh, download, the zip file uh, download after the event. So give us a little time to get it added in, and uh, yes, those case study slides will be included. Um, to Julian, uh, for the, uh, I'm just going to read it here. For the first time today, I heard the term drug sponsor used alongside the term private label distributor, and they sounded like very different roles. Um, is there a requirement for drugs, drug sponsor? So just to sort of paraphrase, is there a difference, or what is the difference between a drug sponsor and the private label distributor, and do either have to register or list? Right. So um, drug sponsors, they have varying um, levels of activities. So uh, just the drug sponsor itself is just someone that, that submits the application. But then also a lot of drug sponsors also then market the drug product under their name, which then makes them the drug sponsor and the private label distributor. Um, so depending on what the drug sponsor does, um, is what they need to uh, do. So regarding the um, private label distributors, they have they do not register because they do not perform any uh, manufacturing processes, but they do have to list. So a PLD has to list, and if the drug sponsor is also acting as a PLD, then they must list also. Thank you. And in a related question. If you are the drug owner, there's a new term uh, we haven't discussed much, um, that you don't, of a drug you don't manufacture, um, you outsource that, but you are responsible for stability testing, annual product reviews, and pharmacovigilance uh, per GMP requirements. Uh, do you need to register? And if yes, under what so, Right. So again, that depends on what you actually do. So if you're responsible for like, if you're just coordinating the stability testing and collecting all the data, then that's just kind of on the back end and you don't need, you don't have any registration requirements. But if you're actually performing the stability testing, then you do have to register and you register under analysis. Thank you. Um, let's go back to uh, Layla. Uh, even if an NDC submission is accepted, is it possible to be non-compliant? Layla, are you on mute? I think um, I had my microphone on mute. Um, yes, the answer um, to that question is yes, absolutely, because as I mentioned in my presentation, when um, you submit uh, your 
registration or listing information, it can be an NDC or it can be even a, an establishment, we employ um, a, a very extensive set of validation rules to check the um, data upon uh, submission. Um, that's when you get those automated validation uh, errors um, in your um, initial submission. But then um, there are certain things that cannot be scanned for error um, in, in the submission. So whether if it's a, an initial submission or um, a revision you're sending to FDA, um, the, the, um, those validation rules cannot detect the error. Uh, one example I uh, provided was the JPEG file. As long as you include a J JPEG file, um, it, it will pass the validation for um, inclusion of um, 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 a carton label. So you can very well like send a, 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 a selfie of yourself in a JPEG, JPEG file, which cannot be detected um, through the validation rules. And so there are certain things that we can detect and stop um, um, right at the gateway, or you know, we can't, and then it's detected later, which uh, will cause probably a compliance case to be created. Thank you for bringing up that tip. We probably should have included in the don'ts of our slides. Please do not include a selfie of yourself as a carton image label. That uh, that would be bad, and you will uh, you would be guaranteed to receive a listing deficiency letter on that. Um, the uh, the next two questions, Layla, have to do with um, NDC numbers and changes in inactive ingredients. Uh, the first one is. Uh, is a new NDC number required for a change in the fragrance of a product? Um, so I, I think I will give myself an F for not including that in my slide. And I just realized that when I was listening to myself um, that physical characteristics of a product is an attribute that, um, that um, will cause an NDC, a new, which require a new NDC product code if um, it changes. And so um, in the regulations specifically, we talk about uh, some of those attributes, um, such as um, you know, color, imprint, score, and things like that. And, and fragrance is not necessarily one of those attributes that is included in the regulation. But what is included in the regulation is just examples of those physical um, characteristics. And so anything as far as physical characteristic of the product changing will require a new NDC product code. Uh, for, for many, um, including visually impaired, impaired, impaired people, um, that is uh, a way of identifying a product. And so therefore, a fragrance, uh, a change in fragrance will be one of those physical characteristics that will require a new NDC product code. Thank you. And this, this next one, you actually answered this next question in that response. But just to reiterate for the person who questioned it, who uh, poses this question, they say, if I have a product uh, or products that are very similar, same ingredients, an API, except I add color to it, does that require a new NDC? Yes. It does. OK. Um, uh, moving on to the, uh, the inactivation notices, uh, Layla, when FDA sends inactivation notices and they are undeliverable, what action does FDA take? And what are the consequences if we as a Oh, I'm sorry. That's a separate question. So, what what con what's the consequence of an in of a non-deliverable inactivation? Um, so that's one thing I think um, every single one of us emphasized in this um, workshop that um, you have to make sure your contact information is always up to date. Um, so. In the case of an activation or any other compliance cases, we move forward with the process regardless. Because if you are not um, updating your contact information, that's that's yet another violation. Um, uh, so in the case of an activation, in your particular question, um, it moves on with an activation with the inactivation, uh, whether if you receive that notification or not. 
the um, information was published in the FRN back in uh, 2019. And then these emails are courtesy emails to let you know that you are um, your product is in danger of being inactivated. Um, and here was the, the next question I was going to throw at you. It says, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, me, Paul, that um, this, you know, the ultimate obligation for listing for the PLD falls on the contract manufacturer or the registered establishment. So the question for you, Layla, here from our uh, audience is, what are the consequences if the CMO uh, misses or, or does not uh, send in the drug listing um, oh, um, and um, if it does if the PLD listing is missing at all uh, what's the problem with that or what's the consequences or what if the PLD submits it instead so the point is that we need um, a, a drug listing um, SPL submitted by the registrant for the drug and manufacturers for the PLD and then another listing SPL to be submitted um, for the drug that is being um, distributed. So um, any of these missing is a violation of the requirements and um, which ultimately falls on the registered establishment unless, again, um, the private label distributor is acting as the authorized agent for the establishment to submit that information um, themselves. So that can be a violation which can lead into any of those uh, final actions in our compliance cases uh, we spoke of um, earlier today, which was either an untitled letter, a warning letter, or um, um, you know anything else that that might inadvertently um, cause any issues for your um, products to be distributed in the U.S. Great. Okay. I I see we are out of time. It is officially five o'clock here on the. East Coast, which means it is five o'clock somewhere. Um, just I, I won't keep everybody long. Um, just a, a big bunch of thank yous to hang uh, to hand out here. Um, thank you to SBI, to Brenda Stoddart, to Ray, to Lisa, everybody at SBIA, and um, and in the Office of Communications there for for helping put a, put this uh, this event on. It's a, a wonderfully successful. Not just a successful event, but a a truly uh, value added event. It, it really it, it, we get a lot of bang for the buck here at FDA uh, by directly reaching the people we need to reach. Um, I want to thank uh, Jeff and the folks at Concerted Solutions for all the technical assistance here. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Um, and I really want to thank everybody out there, all all you in the audience, all the registered folks. Um, for taking the time uh, to, to out of your day uh, to attend this, to listen to the sessions. Um, we know you're busy, but, uh, but we believe here at, at FDA that, that uh, you know, the, as the saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So we really appreciate when you guys take the time to get the submissions and the data right the first time. And, and we, we will work with you to help you do that because it, it's worth our time. It, it's far more valuable to help you get it right the first time than it is for us to spend all the time it takes to go after the people who do it wrong. Um, so thank you again. Thank you for taking your time to listen. And thank you for taking the time uh, to get your submissions uh, complete and accurate. Um, that concludes our presentation, our, the webinar. Um, I hope you all uh, found it useful and valuable. And again, if you have any questions that were that went unanswered, you may uh, you may either either download um, the zip file uh, from the uh, on the event locate uh, the event website, excuse me, uh, for the event, all the recordings and, and the slides, um, or you may submit any question you have to our eDerlis help desk. Thank you again and have a good day.